The Debt Collective is a union for debtors. So just like workers join together in a labor union, we believe that debtors should organize, unite collectively to advocate for their interests. And this is a form of coming together, a form of economic power that complements other struggles. So you can be in a labor union and also be in a debtors union. You can be unemployed and yet still have debt. You can be a student, you can be a retiree. So one of the advantages of organizing around debt, if we can call it that, is that it sticks to you no matter where you go, no matter what your circumstances are. You know, it sticks with people to the grave and sometimes beyond. So we think that working people, poor people can't afford to live, leave power on the table. Our debts are somebody else's assets. So there's power in those debts if we come together and organize. So um, let's talk about how you guys are structured. Um, is this like a dues paying union Mm -hmm. That's the, that is the ambition to be a completely member supported dues paying union. So actually we just launched in the last few months, uh, uh, our union, uh, our dues collecting page, because ultimately I believe if, you know, if you're interested in political economy and you think about how, um, you know, how money works, like, I think it's very important that people actually control the groups that they're part of. So I think it's really important that we have organizations that are supported by dues, just like labor unions are, as opposed to being supported by philanthropists, by grants. Uh, so that I, that's critical for long-term sustainability. Um, of course, you know, when you're organizing debtors, you're organizing people who have negative wealth. <laughs> and so right. the thing is that you know, all of our resources. So we offer tools that people can dispute their debts, dispute errors on their credit reports. We're about to launch an anti-eviction tool, right. uh, actually a tool for disputing bail bond and immigration bond debts. Those are all free to use. You don't have to pay, uh, pay dues to join the debt collective. But I think anyone on the left should actually be really concerned about building organizations that are supported by the members and thus accountable to members. That's right. I think that's a really important point. I'm glad that you, met, you, you alluded to the, the industrial complex, whether it's a nonprofit industrial complex or not. Um, a lot of organizations out there are beholden to larger donations that come in, foundations. Uh, the media. And media, exactly. Well, media is an obvious one. <laughs> I mean, even though we are, are, are user-funded, we still use platforms that are controlling our livelihoods, let's just say it that way, um, and our ability to get the word out. So uh, Astra, where um, is the majority of the focus right now? What types of debt are you guys focusing on? We've made our name uh, organizing around student debt. So the debt collective emerged out of Occupy Wall Street. There was something called the Occupy Student Debt Campaign. It was the first time I ever heard people call for student loan cancellation, full stop, cancel it all, it shouldn't exist. And for public college, free to uh, free public college for everybody. Uh, so that's, that's sort of our genesis, but we organize around different types of debt. We think about actually the household because there's this lie, right? That our debts are individual. This, this idea that, you know, we, we shake hands with the creditor, we're taking out our debts, uh, you know, autonomously making this choice and thus we have to uphold our end of the bargain. The truth is, you know, and student loans are a good example of this, parents borrow for their children, right? People mortgage their houses so their right. kids can have a chance just of having a decent life. You know, people have to make choices all the time. Do I pay this bill or do I feed my kids, right? Uh, or do I help my family members? So our debts are never individual obligations. They're always bound up with each other. So student debt, though, uh, is a powerful form of indebtedness. It's, it's the main type of debt besides mortgages that regular people hold. And it's so clearly a policy mistake. A generation ago, people went to school for free. They didn't carry these incredible burdensome debt loads. Uh, and also 96% of it is held by the federal government, which means that the minute Joe Biden enters office, that man has power already vested by Congress. So Congress gave the authority to cancel debts back in 1965. He can eliminate it all. It's debt owed to the federal government. It's a major policy mistake. Almost everybody recognizes that compared to the days of Occupy Wall Street when we were Super shouting nice. in the park, right? <laughs> People now yeah. agree there's a crisis here. Well, this is a crisis the Democrats can actually solve. Uh, if they don't, it's an abuse of power. So we're in a major contest right now over student debt. But there are other forms of debt we need to organize around medical debt, right. utilities, 
uh, even you know predatory auto loans. This is just the beginning of a bigger of a bigger fight. Um, let's just stick to, to student debt for a second because it is getting a lot of news right now because of. Um, uh, Senator Schumer calling for the elimination of the first fifty thousand dollars of student debt. Uh, I assume that's public debt, not not you know, mm-hmm. whatever the federal government can provide. But you just mentioned that Congress gave the president the ability to eliminate the government to eliminate debt um, in 1965. Can you tell? Have we ever done that? Is there is there any yeah. precedent? Mm-hmm. Yeah, there sure is. So. This authority is called compromise and settlement. So when you grant an entity the ability to produce debt, it's implicit that they also have the ability to cancel it, to cease collections, right? So the Department of Education has this authority by its ability to lend. It also has the ability to compromise, to settle. This is something, though, that was not really explored until one of uh, the co-founders of the Debt Collective, actually, Luke Heron, who's now at Yale Law School, building on work for, uh, by the brilliant Eileen Con- O'Connor, who uh, works at the Project for uh, on Predatory Student Lending at Harvard, started to think, well, hold on, how could, how could this, uh, this authority that is already there actually be used to uh, address this massive and growing crisis? The fact is that compromise and settlement has been used. In fact, it was just used by Donald Trump because Donald Trump uh, did something that, uh, you know, I was actually surprised by and that he suspended universally all student loan collections. And and it actually was revealed in a press conference that his administration used compromise and settlement authority to cancel interest. So the question for the Democrats as they come into office in January is, are you going to be outdone by Donald Trump? We are facing a pandemic, an economic emergency, uh, and the student loan suspension, people not having to uh, send to the federal government 200, 300, 400, 2,000, 3,000 dollars a month, which is what some people uh, actually have to pay, is the is you know basically the difference between life and death, having a roof over your head or not for a lot of people, um, and allows and that you have money no choice. To- mm-hmm. I mean, for I mean, I assume anybody who's watching the show <laughs> probably is familiar with the fact that you can't go bankrupt, you can't declare bankruptcy if you default on your debt. You have it tied to you. They will seize your assets before you can pay for your food, your housing. Um, you know, and that's uh, notably how Hillary Clinton thought every millennial was living in their parents' basement uh, because they had to choose between housing or food. Uh, and yeah. partly, uh, we have we have Joe Biden partly to thank for the fact that that is also the case for private student loans. Um, you know, he was very instrumental in the 2005 bankruptcy reform. So, you know, he could also make amends. Uh, there. He owes us <laughs> uh, for his role in the student debt crisis. But you're exactly right. Student loans are very unique in that they are one of the, f- the main kinds of debts that can't be discharged in bankruptcy. You can never get rid of them. And default, the consequences of default can be incredibly severe. Uh, your credit score, of course, tanks, which means the costs of other kinds of debt go up. You might not be able to get a job. You might not be able to rent an apartment. But in some states, they will actually take away your license let's say a professional license to, you know, perhaps cut hair or to teach, therefore you lose your job. What? In some states, they take away your driver's license if you default. Uh, they garnish old people's social security. This is insane. Okay, so you want someone to pay the debt down, but you're going to basically disarm them with any tools that could help them pay down that debt, getting to work. Pers- exactly, it's a bind. So we launched the first ever student debt strike in 2015. That's part of how we put this issue on the national agenda. We launched a student debt strike with people who had attended a predatory for-profit college, Corinthian Colleges, Inc., then students from DeVry, uh, from the Art Institutes, other predatory for-profit colleges uh, began to join us. Of course, those colleges are the ones that have seen the most business since the pandemic started because they're mostly online, et cetera. Um, and Donald Trump and his administration you know, basically took off what few regulations there were on them. So we launched this strike that won actually a billion dollars of relief uh, and counting to date through various legal strategies from the Obama administration and from Betsy DeVos. But there was one point uh, in 2015 or 16 where the then governor of Florida got on Fox News and actually said to our strikers, well, yeah, well, we're going to take your driver's licenses away. 
So, I mean, this is just part of how it's just, it, it's emblematic of what a punitive system this is and so unnecessarily punitive. Why should we be punishing people who want to get an education, who are told that this is the only way, you know, to make more than minimum wage? Why are we garnishing the social security of uh, retirees, you know, because they can't pay their debts? So it's all got to stop. That's the debt collective's, you know, position is that yeah. we need to admit this is a failure, cancel all of the debt and fix the problem at the source. Um, and that, that's, that's the, that is the logical thing to do. It's the economically rational thing to do because it will boost the economy. Of course. Right? <laughs> All of that money will go to spend you know, on, on the things people need to survive. So it'll create jobs. Some estimates say it'll create a million jobs a year. That was before the pandemic. It'll create more. Uh, they say it'll actually have a bigger effect now. It'll boost GDP. This is a win-win for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of misleading arguments out there about how canceling student reg student debt is regressive. The fact is student debt is regressive because yeah. millionaires and billionaires don't take out student debt to go to college. That's you what know, being rich is. <laughs> you know what's so, exactly. You know what's so interesting to me about this is um, I was trying to think, well, what, what's the rationale for Wall Street, Chuck Schumer, to suddenly be advocating for relieving student debt? Other than smart politics, maybe not wanting to be primary, whatever, you can look at the basic politics. But ultimately, it's in the interest of so many other financial sectors for people to be able to pay off their student debt because clearly that's where folks' money is going to first. And if you can't pay for your rent, it means it hurts the real estate industry. If you can't pay for all the other bills, credit card bills, it hurts that industry. And so I, I find it really fascinating about like, okay, now you have like different financial sectors fighting each other and who's gonna win? Who, who, who's gonna win on the chessboard? Well, I think it's a very astute observation. I wish that those, I wish that the capitalist class was divided more and that they were actually coming out and arguing for this. So unfortunately, you know, that is the logic. So I 100% think what you said is really astute that, you know, the sort of um, a building trade should be really into this idea because there's lots of evidence from the New York Fed, for example, that high rates of indebtedness, particularly around student loan, suppress homeownership, right? So yeah, realtors, builders, right? Come People, on, real estate industry. <laughs> yeah, I get on you board. Love, you know you love to do this stuff, <laughs> right? But you know, so because I, you know, I think right. That's sometimes changes made when the capitalist class fragments and different pe different aspects of it are sort of you know uh, having a conflict. But what we're seeing, you know, is not the associations of realtors stepping up or, <laughs> but we are seeing Goldman Sachs, for example, um, and also uh, J.P. Morgan and their policy proposals saying, oh, sure, maybe a little bit of, you know, moratoriums, maybe a few suspensions here, but don't cancel the debt. Because I think what they see is that there are bigger implications because they, they very much were happy after 2008 when the banks got bailed out, right? When the financial sector was able to get aid. They were very happy uh, in the spring of this year when the corporate debt market was stabilized in an unprecedented way when the federal government bought up billions of dollars of bad corporate debt. Uh, they do not want little people to know that actually debts can be renegotiated, written right. off, because you know the fact is that that's what that's what debt is. Debt is something that is negotiable. But we are in a paradigm, and we have been for a long time, where that only applies to the rich and the powerful. And so, what the debt collective says is, well, what debtors need to do is organize, and to wield our collective leverage, so that so that we are able also um, to demand write downs, write offs, and the abolition of these odious debts. Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the nomikisho.com to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers.